uh, I want to introduce Frederick with the Eclipse Foundation. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I've had a few interactions with Frederick. I'm quite excited uh, about this session. Um, and also, uh, Frederick, one of the things that we talked about was uh, keeping this at a high level, just in terms of giving us an update on where things are, what, what it's about. Um, and then they have quite a few projects that um, are doing different things uh, up and down the stack from hardware uh, up. Um, and uh, <clears throat> depending on interest, we'll uh, organize follow-on meetups to dig into each of these individual uh, projects. Um, so if there's anything as we're going through this that um, looks interesting to you, uh, let me know and uh, we'll, uh, um, we'll get that set up. Otherwise, uh, thank you, Frederick, and uh, I'll leave it to you. All right, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, everyone, for uh, well joining today and taking the time of, uh, to listen to me. So, let me share my screen. All right. Uh, so, essentially. Uh, the presentation I'm doing today is a kind of generic introduction to why open source is important in the context of the Internet of Things. Okay. And, uh, you know, I will take this opportunity to, to tell you a bit about the organization as well. So I will keep those details for a bit later. But in my case, I manage uh, IoT and edge computing programs at the foundation. So my responsibility is essentially two things. Keep an eye on 50 plus open source projects just in the domain of IoT and edge. OK, uh, so we have many more than that, but I take care specifically of those 50 or so. And then on the other side, uh, another part of my job is uh, interact with our community. So find new members, present about the technology, uh, you know, and generally speaking, have uh, conversations with other open source organizations or uh, things like that. Uh, and all of that is in the spirit of promoting our technology and promoting open source uh, in general. So. Uh, with that said, let's get started. So uh, one important thing about open source, you know, if we take a step back from the world of technology, really, uh, and, and you look at human history, I was a history teacher in the past, so I have a tendency to always look back to the ancient, uh, to antiquity or stuff like that. Um, but when you look at human history, there's the realization that any time human, human history, if, something was open, then ecosystems appeared around it. And a good example of this is beer. Uh, ancient Egyptians, we think, uh, discovered beer by accident probably two or 3,000 years ago. And it was probably because their, their whole, uh, their whole uh, diet was structured around wheat. And so they were storing wheat in those big uh, silos that they were uh, building on the ground. And at some point, some, some water got in and, you know, uh, accidentally uh, this gave birth to beer and they perfected the process. But the thing is that there was no corporate, there were no corporations or anything like that in the time. And beer was soon a kind of open secret in the sense that the, the, the industrial secret, so to speak, to make beer is something that, you know, took the world by storm. And now when we look at what beer has become, you have all of those beers from all, over, all around the world and they all are variations on the same team, but, you know, you wouldn't have this variety and this quality of beers from the whole, the, all around the world if, you know, beer has been, had been kept as a, a appropriatory thing, you know, 2000 or 3000 years ago, or the same with the wheel. And, you know, and, and, and we can apply this, this example to, to wine, uh, to vinegar, to whatever you like. I mean, the fact is when something was open from the very start, you have this diversity and competition and innovation all over the place. And we all know that uh, a lack of competition stifles innovation. So uh, in that sense, openness is really a precondition to get innovation in the market. All right. And one interesting thing 
about uh, open source as a factor for openness is that specifically in IT, uh, we uh, we uh, our market research really highlighted recently that more and more organizations are factoring open source in their uh, deployment plans around IoT. And that's really important uh, because that wasn't the case necessarily 10 years or even five years ago. So the market is changing and it's not just me extolling the virtues of open source. People in organizations like yours are uh, making this choice uh, day in and day out now. And the interesting thing about uh, this little slide, which has been extracted from our uh, 2019 commercial adoption survey, we are preparing the, the 2021 version uh, right now and working on the questions. So uh, we'll we'll let you know when the time will be uh, will come to participate. But uh, only 14% of our respondents in that survey told us that they are looking at purely closed source proprietary IoT solutions. So 60 plus percent of people are factoring open source in their plans. And this shows how transformative and how dominant open source IoT platforms are becoming in the market. Now, why are they doing this? That's an important question. And uh, this, uh, this is a, a data point that's not in the, in the publicly available um, deck that we distribute for the survey results so something that i'm i'm sharing with you uh, uh you know as a favor but it's interesting to uh, to realize that the number one reason that people told us why they are looking at open source is not the cost yes cost is important it's great when it's free right but there's more than that number one in our survey was flexibility and number four was more control uh number three sorry <laughs> Number three. So, yes, is number two, but flexibility, more control, there's a team emerging there. Open source puts you in control of what goes on the device or what the device is doing and enables you to do many, many things, being more flexible in the value that you provide to your own organization or even to, to your customers and partners. Uh, and that's critical. That's critical because uh, the day of uh, cookie cutter solutions are, are over and we need uh, personalization and customization in order to be successful in the market. So, uh, if you're less familiar with the world of open source and the world of software even, uh, what is open source about? Uh, well, essentially, uh, we can compare one here with beer. Uh, to do beer, you need some form of recipe. You know the ingredients. You need you need water. You need uh, wheat. Uh, you need some hops. And uh, is there this industrial process uh, we call that brewery or the brew process that will give us beer uh, at the outer end? And the fact is, uh, it's it's very easy to get started in the brewery market comparatively to many other industries because the industrial process uh, to make beer has been an open secret for such a long time so you can buy uh, starter kits to start your own microbrewery fairly fairly easily in the open market and uh, this lowers the barrier to entry to new pitchers, which means more good beer to drink so if you're trying to to make a parallel between the world of beer and the world of software here. So the source code is literally our recipe. Uh, and we use uh, tools like a compiler in order to build literally software that we run on a specific computer, whether it's phone, uh, a game console, uh, you know, really anything. And the same comparison can apply to open source hardware as well. And that's a concept that we will discover a bit later in the presentation. So there are, let's call them programming languages, like system Verilog uh, that you see on the slide, that describe capabilities and internal structure of computer chip. Okay. And hardware makers are using that to design their chips, even uh, larger ones like uh, AMD and Intel. And essentially, once they have that, they can go to a foundry, so a place where they make chips, in order to, to produce systems on the chips or CPUs or other electronic components. Okay, And, and so uh, this shows that the concept of open source doesn't just apply to software, but to hardware as well. And to many other, uh, many other domains, in fact. Uh, I mean, cooking is a good example, 
recipes uh, circulate all over the place and there are specific uh, processes that you use to do that kind of recipe or authors, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, open source is mostly about software. Now it's also about hardware, but it can be about many, many other things uh, in our daily lives. So what is open source in a more formal fashion? So there are three important points to remember here. First, when we say something is open source, this means that the source code is made freely available by the people holding the copyrights. And that's maybe an annoying thing about open source in the sense that you need, <laughs> we need to tell uh, to talk a bit about the legal aspects of, uh, of things uh, in order to, to, to really understand. So when you write, let's say, uh, a novel, um, you know, on your own, you automatically hold the copyright on what you are writing. And in the same way, when you write code, if this is code that you write by yourself after hours at home, you hold the copyrights to that. And if you do this at your job, if you are a software developer, then it means that the copyright is held by your employer. So essentially, whoever holds the copyright is the one deciding what can be done with the source code. So in the case of large code users like Windows, for example, uh, or the games that run on your phone, the copyright holders are the people that wrote the code and they decide to keep the source code to themselves. So all, all that you have is the executable version, the code, you know, the runtime code that will run on your computer, but you don't have the source code. You cannot modify Windows. You cannot modify uh, Tinder or whatever in order, in order to get better matches or whatever. Um, so that's really an important uh, thing to remember about. The first thing to, to determine if something is open source is, can I download the source code, the integral source code to it somewhere? Okay, and, and if I have access to that source code, then I can compile it myself. Then there's the second aspect in open source, which is uh, the freedom. And freedom, well, uh, I should say freedoms because there are a few freedoms that have to be there and granted by the copyright holder in order for the code to be really open source. And uh, specifically, uh, we say that to be open source, the code must be uh, redistributed. You can redistribute it, uh, redistribute it sorry, modify it uh, as you wish. And this includes commercial purposes. Okay. This is important because uh, some, some licenses that say they are open source will put uh, heavy restrictions on commercial use. And then this, uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, um, this slows down the growth and adoption of the technology in the market. So in our case, especially at the Eclipse Foundation, we believe uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, open source is great, but you know, we need to pay the bills somehow, so we are actual friendly. Uh, but uh, those freedoms are really important. The fact that you can redistribute the code to anyone freely and that you can modify it in any way you want freely, including if you want to build commercial products. So that's uh, another, another set of criteria to determine if platform is open source or not. And finally, there's a third aspect about the governance in the sense that, okay, the code is there, but who is taking decisions about what will get in the newest version? That's important because even if something is opened up, it doesn't mean that the people controlling that code base will accept your changes. Yes, you can, you can make your own copy and modify it, but if you want those changes to be reflected in the upstream version, in the source version that you started with, well, there, there are political aspects there. There's a, there's a power structure somewhere. And uh, this leads us to the important remark that not all open source is the same. Okay, uh, if you pick up a small library written by, by I don't know, me, uh, you know, uh, after hours, and uh, I put that on GitHub because I want to share, it's one thing. You have no guarantee of support. You have no guarantee of quality from me. Uh, and, and certainly no protection about potential uh, lawsuits about patents that would be violated by the code or anything like that. 
then there are open source projects that are, uh, we call that single vendor open source. So single vendor open source, the code is available, but there's a single entity that's holding the rights to the code, which means that, for example, if you take uh, the Go language by Google, it's a very popular programming language uh, in the market right now, and it's great. Uh, at the technical, uh, technological level, I have nothing against it. But the problem with the Go language is that it's completely controlled by Google. And many times it happened that the Go community, people that took the, 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 the tool, building software with it, uh, and now they want new features. And Google says, oh, we have a look. And then after many, many months and many, many battles on their forums uh, online, uh, they finally say, no, we don't care about this. We won't implement it. And then, well, there's no recourse. Well, obviously, it's open source. So someone can download the Go source and then modify it in whatever way, but their own little version will not take off because there's not a community around it, okay? So most of the most open source projects that are successful are not necessarily single vendor uh, because when, you know, the, the ones that are successful are really the ones that are um, owned by behemoths like Google or Microsoft or Apple, uh, you know, companies that already have a clout in the market. But if you're trying to do this on your own, uh, building a open source community is hard. And this is why there's a third alternative, which is you ask a neutral party to take ownership of the code and you start a project under a foundation like the Eclipse Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation, etc. Okay. Now, uh, you may ask, okay, all of this is great, but what I care is about IoT. Uh, so how does open source help with uh, building an IoT solution? Well, uh, to answer this question, we must ask ourselves, uh, what are the characteristics of an IoT solution? What makes IoT different from a typical software project, uh, your website, or, or even something like a website like LinkedIn or whatever? So uh, the first thing about IoT is that the lifespan of the solution is very long. It, you know, we count in years, if not in decades, in some uh, in some instances. As some of you are in manufacturing, I'm quite sure you don't rip off everything that's on the on the factory floor every every two years or every five years, right? Uh, you know, we're talking about 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, depending on the industry. And uh, when working around IoT, that's a fact that's completely unavoidable. Uh, then there's the fact that no one, literally no one, can deliver you an end-to-end -end solution in IoT. You will pick software from place, you will pick sensors from another place, even the giants like Schneider Electric and uh, Aviva and whatnot, they can't deliver a complete end-to-end -end solution on their own. You will have to deal with multiple vendors. And this is, uh, again, an important thing to consider. Then there are the constraints. I mean, whatever hardware or software solution that you deploy will have to deal with compute limitations. Uh, you will have to keep an eye on power consumption. Uh, you will want to uh, harden the devices against the vibration, temperature, electrical arcs, and many other factors. So we can say that an IoT solution is literally defined by the constraints uh, it has to face. And finally, there's the connectivity aspect in the sense that, well, we Talking about IoT, Internet of Things. So the internet in IoT stands, in fact, for network. So what I do, there's a network, but, but this network, you can bet your life on it, won't be stable or reliable. And you have to design around this, okay? And so how does open source help to face those various changes or, or uh, fulfill the requirements that stem from the characteristics of IoT solution? Uh, essentially, uh, when we consider the lifespan, if the code is open source, you're not at risk that the code will be discontinued by anyone. And if it is discontinued, let's say the main contributor drops support for it or they, they build something else that they will focus on going forward, you can maintain the code yourself. And if you don't have the skill, you can pay someone to do so. And that's really important and a game changer. You're not constrained by uh, the life cycle and business strategies of your suppliers. 
when uh, you deal with open source. Then there's the heterogeneity aspect. It's much easier to integrate the platforms or adapt the code to a specific use if you have access to the source code. You're not stuck with a uh, feature set that's set in stone because essentially <laughs> if the features are not there you can build them yourself uh, environmental constraints of all sorts you can when you have access to the source code tweak it very finely to fit your use case and cut the features maybe that you don't need uh, in various uh, environments and then when you consider connectivity, there are many, many, many connectivity options, but in pre-made stacks, they will nudge you towards the little vendors that they have relationships with. Well, the fact is when you work starting with an open source base, whether it is for the hardware, software, or both, uh, what will happen is that you have much more choice, you have the freedom to choose whatever really fits your use case. And then there's the fundamental realization. You know, the number one reason why open source is so important. The fact that ultimately any innovation becomes a commodity. And commodities, tell me, uh, do you remember what brand of flour you have in your cupboard? Do you remember the, the brand of toothpaste? Maybe you have some preferences in those domains, but ultimately, you know, we buy those things without paying too much attention and we'll switch from one brand to another when there's a special and things like that, okay? But we care about the brand of car or the brand of, of phone that we've got because those things are higher value items, okay? But in due time, in due time, Okay, uh, anything, anything that's an innovation will become a commodity and uh, eventually will be found in, uh, you know, very, very, very cheaply and you won't pay attention to the brand, guaranteed. And that thing means that's exactly the reason why in IT we have frameworks in the sense that there are established frameworks that people reuse uh, because essentially they have commoditized the whole segment of the market. You won't gain a competitive advantage today in IoT by writing a memory allocation routine at a very low level yourself. What will distinguish you are you know, the higher end customer focused features that you will implement, okay? And that means you need if something is a commodity at the bottom, like an operating system, like uh, a communications library and etc., this means uh, there's an advantage in building it together, you know, as, as a market, so to speak, as a community, instead of trying to do it on your own and waste your money of that. So ultimately, the number one argument for open source is that in due time, anything becomes a commodity and you have to stay above the commodity line in order to preserve your margins. And a good place to do that, uh, to do open source is the Eclipse Foundation. And well, okay, I'm not completely objective there. They pay me after all, but really uh, we feel that we have a unique approach, which is community driven, which is focusing on the code first and which is commercial friendly. OK, uh, when we say we are community driven, it's literally that my role as the program manager is not to direct the technological direction of our projects. My role is to serve them, to provide them the services and support that they need in order to succeed. But every of our projects at the foundation is its own little self-contained meritocracy. OK, so they take the decisions. They, uh, they write the code, they decide what features to implement, and yes, I can have a conversation with them and trying to nudge them in a direction, but ultimately our uh, contributors and our committers, they are the people making the decisions. We say we are code first because we care about code that works and code that's really used in the market. We don't do POCs, we don't do abandonware. So from time to time, we'll kill projects if they have became, you know, inactive. And uh, that's really important. You know, we, we care about the code. And yes, we like architectures and blueprints and stuff like that. But Typically, we start with the code and we will develop pictures and blueprints from working code that's used by real people to build real working software uh, all, around, all around the world. 
And finally, we are commercial friendly. So yes, we are open source and we believe in it, but this is not just about, hey, Kumbaya, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we live in the open. Uh, this, is not, uh, this is not a free for all or anarchy. Uh, we are trying to foster a community where organizations will be able to uh, financially succeed and then thrive because they use open source. Okay, and that's really an important dimension. And uh, this is reflected by the fact that we are uh, member funded. So essentially, uh, the way the foundation operates is that our members pay membership fees. And this is what finances the staff and the services that we deliver. So what makes our approach different is that uh, compared to a GitHub project or single vendor open source, uh, we have many, many value added services that we offer to our projects. And in fact, uh, and that's something really important to start a project at the Eclipse Foundation, you don't even need to be a member. You approach us with a project proposal and if we approve it, you get in and yeah, you don't need to pay us a cent or to be a member. We will support you the same way we support every of our projects. But what we offer in the way of service is uh, very fundamental thing that make a difference. Like we have a, a very robust development process that has been uh, honed since 2004 in order to deliver the Eclipse ID and then uh, all of the other projects that we have at the foundation and we have close to 400 of them so we've got quite a lot of expertise we offer vendor neutral governance which means that essentially when you have an eclipse project we are a neutral third party that ensure that every contributor to a project plays by the rule okay so a situation like the go language will not happen with us because essentially if uh, uh, one party to a project is not responsive to the needs of others we will step in and we will reestablish order to ensure that the needs and requirements of everyone are taken into consideration and then uh, we have a whole part of our team that's focused on ip licensing and that's really important so when you contribute code to eclipse we check licenses for your dependencies we check that there are no uh, problems around patents and stuff like that uh, we check the trademarks for the project names and things like that which means that when someone downloads an eclipse component from our website to integrate it in their solution they have the assurance that everything is okay in terms of intellectual property and and that's important you won't necessarily find that elsewhere in the it market in other organizations like us so, uh, by the numbers, what are we doing at the Eclipse Foundation? We are getting close at this point to uh, 400 projects. This slide is obviously never up to date. Uh, the numbers are always growing. Uh, we have 320 plus members. And overall, when you consider all of the projects we have, that's roughly 240 million lines of code. All of this supported by a staff of roughly 30. Uh, most of us are in Ottawa, Canada. We have some staff members in the US, in Utah and uh, uh, Oregon. Uh, so close enough to you guys. Uh, and uh, we have 12 working groups that are gatherings of organizations that support specifically our projects uh, in the open source. So this is, yeah, the slide where we put uh, every every member logo. So I will uh, skip you the details, but uh, one thing that's important here, you will see all sorts of organizations. You know, there are universities in there. There are uh, US-based uh, entities founded by the US government, like the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in uh, Richmond, Washington. So, uh, well, that's, that's close enough to Seattle. Uh, in fact, a two hour drive. Um, so uh, so this is not just large IT players. This is organizations of all size, startups, mid-sized companies, all of that. Uh, and, and really, uh, they all work together on various uh, projects. Now, what do we do at the Eclipse Foundation? We have four uh, strategic focus areas. We do other things, OK? Uh, but uh, what you see on the slides are the four pillars of our activity and our growth right now. So the most ancient one are the development tools. We are known as, uh, you know, the, the home to the Eclipse ID. 
okay uh, development environment that's been around since the early 2000s with still 6 million active users on a daily basis that's quite impressive and uh, we still care about that but now we have expanded in browser based tools okay we call that cloud cloud based uh, development and uh, we are working really hard on on bringing those tools to the market and then on the other side we've got uh, what we call cloud native java so we are uh, we took over some uh, technologies that were open source at oracle and essentially gave it a new name so you may have heard in the past uh, of uh, java enterprise edition and uh, the new name for this at Eclipse is Jakarta EE uh, because Oracle gave us the code, but not the trademarks for the name. So we had to change the name. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, there's the automotive sector. So we've got five working groups in that department. And even a company like Daimler, for example, is a strategic member of the Eclipse Foundation because of what we do in automotive. So uh, working uh, with OEMs, tier ones, uh, you know, and, and their suppliers uh, all over the place. Finally, there's IoT and Edge, my domain, uh, where we work uh, for Internet of Things solutions and edge computing. Uh, throughout those four sectors and everything else that we uh, deliver, uh, we offer a number of services, governance, uh, the development process, ecosystem development and marketing. That's what I'm doing here, speaking to you and letting you know about the great stuff that our members do, IP management, licensing, and also infrastructure. So when you have a project at Eclipse, there are build servers that you can use, there are environments, virtual servers. Anyway, we, we, we give our project the infrastructure they need in order to succeed. Which means that, uh, interestingly, the business model for our members looks a bit like this, where essentially there's a collaboration layer where together our members jointly define a roadmap and build the core open source capability. So this is the commodity part, so to speak, the part that's shared among the members. And then there's this value line on the above which you do profit. And essentially, uh, on the top of that, there's the competition layer. So many of our members compete with each other, but they work together on things that are commodities. And then they focus on their resources on the top of that on features that will provide them differentiation in the market and there's a great dynamic at work there because essentially uh, in collaborating uh, this gives our members product ready technology so all of our projects are commercial grade and, and production ready okay and that's another important uh, feature we we wouldn't accept code that couldn't be running in production because it's just a poc or things like that we don't do that so those product ready technologies get incorporated in commercial products. And from that, we get requirements, use cases, and other information to improve the open source offerings that we have at Eclipse. And all of that is, you know, under the governance uh, of our processes, of uh, the open vendor neutral environment that we create at the foundation. Uh, and overall, since the start of the foundation in 2004, uh, all of our members together created, we estimate that we created a value, a shared value of about 13 billion US dollars together. And that's quite significant. So ultimately, what we're trying to create is, uh, you know, this ecosystem, which is a virtuous cycle where our projects and working groups essentially influence the business models of our members. And this is something I will describe to you. I will speak about one of our members at the end to give you a taste of what they are doing in open source. And this, in turn, those innovative business models that are structured around open source create value that then you know enable our projects and uh, working group to move forward so let's now focus on the eclipse iot working group one of the 12 working groups that we've got at the foundation so eclipse iot is focused on three things first uh, we have uh, tools and frameworks for constraint devices okay or connected 
things. Uh, and then on the other end, we have IoT cloud platforms, and we've got some edge computing platforms in the middle that enable you to, to link the two. And in the case of edge computing, we even have a separate working group for that, the Eclipse Edge Native Working Group, but our people in IoT uh, care pretty much about edge as well, so that's why it's on the slide. So this is the close to current membership of Eclipse IoT. So we've got uh, three strategic members, Bosch, Eurotech, and Red Hat. So those are the ones that put additional money in the to finance our activities. And at the same time, uh, they get a seat on the steering committee. So they define the strategy and vision for the working group. And then we have a whole bunch of other members in there. Uh, some of them are very large organizations like uh, Intel, Huawei, IBM. And some others are very, uh, very small startups. Uh, for example, um, we've got uh, Edgeworks, uh, which is based in the Bay Area that, uh, you know, uh, maintain uh, their edge computing platform called Eclipse IOFOG with us. And then there's the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory that open sourced the project with us. And you see also open robotics. So I was excited that you have a, a coming meetup uh, with, uh, with them because uh, we believe in the ROS2 operating system and try to integrate with that. And at the same time, we believe in the stack that we've got at Eclipse IoT and they are a member on our side. Uh, we also do something with a sister organization, uh, Open Hardware. Uh, so the Open Hardware group is a sister organization to the Eclipse Foundation that's focused on open source uh, uh, processor cores. You may have heard about the RISC-V architecture, and, and RISC-V is, is fantastic. It's an instruction set, you know, like the ARM one, like the Intel one, that you can use in order to build processors, and it's open source. But an instruction set in, on its own is just, yeah, a blueprint of a blueprint for a processor. So in the case of Open Hardware Group, they have a number of projects, and I put the links to the two main ones here, where essentially they take the RISC-V instruction set and provide you the system Verilog for CPU cores, and in fact, system on the chips uh, are built around those CPU cores. So you've got one, a 32-bit four-stage core that's good for a constraint device, and another one, a six-stage uh, processor that's uh, obviously consuming a bit more power, but fully supports Linux in this case, and uh, that you could use in a gateway or edge node or whatever. And uh, we don't do open hardware, uh, open source hardware at the foundation, uh, the Eclipse Foundation, because we are focused on software. But we work very closely with the open hardware group to have th this vision of a complete end-to-end -end ecosystem where essentially open hardware provide the CPU cores and tool chains and even uh, development environments on one side that are tailored to their core five lines of cores. And on the other end, uh, we provide this open source IoT ecosystem uh, with the 50 projects we have in the IoT space and some development tools are as well. So we meet in the middle and uh, our cloud development tools uh, group is also in the middle. Whether you really have you know, something where you can go open source all the way from the system on the chip to the tools that you are using, to the libraries that you are leveraging and ultimately to deliver a solution on the top of that. And I must say, uh, yeah, uh, essentially the core five cores from Open Hardware Group, uh, you go on GitHub and you can download the system Verilog and you can go to a foundry and get a chip out of that. But the nice thing about RISC V is that the instruction set is extensible. So you can get in that. You can take the designs of the Core 5 family and add features to them or cut features from them for your specific use case and have a chip that's really tweaked to your specific requirements. And that's something that you cannot uh, you cannot get in the commercial world. Uh, at the same time, we we also work very happily with uh, with ARM and other players in the CPU market that provide design services. But we feel that an open source approach end to end has its benefits uh, as well. And now let's have a look at uh, an example of an organization that really invested a lot in an open source approach with the Eclipse Foundation, uh, Bosch. So Bosch is an industrial giant. 
you know, they make virtuals, they make auto parts, they make so many things. And they've been for a long time be a, a strategic member of the Eclipse Foundation and a strategic member of Eclipse IoT. So at this point in time, Bosch has contributed more than 60 developers to open source projects. They created six projects of their own. They participate more than that. And uh, over time, uh, they wrote uh, nearly 2 million lines of code. And you see the logos for the main projects uh, that uh, Bosch contributed to the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, you've got, for example, in the middle, Hono, which is a message routing platform for IoT solution. You've got Hub, which is a platform to deploy software updates to constraint devices. You've got Ditto, which is a complete framework and runtime for digital twins. And digital twins are really important in manufacturing. At least uh, they are a pattern that uh, really can transform the industry. So uh, certainly it's a fantastic platform. Uh, Eclipse Cooksa is a platform for connected vehicles, both a cloud platforms and what you would put in the infotainment system. Uh, in order to, to drive the screen uh, for the radio and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's Vorto, which is a modeling environment where you can define models that would be imported in Ditto and some of the other tools. So, I mean, it's a tremendous contribution, and this is just what Bosch did. So we've got contributions from Red Hat and our third members uh, as well. And as Hans was, uh, was saying, we have a very exciting project in uh, Eclipse uh, Stream Sheets, where essentially you can visualize in real time uh, IoT data flows in a spreadsheet-like environment and write formulas like you would do in Excel or Google Sheets. So anyway, uh, we don't have time to cover all of the 50 plus projects that we've got uh, now. But this gives you a taste of the kind of technology that we've got. Uh, so my call to action to you, uh, please become a member. Uh, please join our working groups to contribute to our community. And please participate in open source collaboration and innovation. So at this point, the last thing I have to say is, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. And uh, I'm quite sure there are a few questions uh, in the chat, so uh, we can uh, we can have a look at them and try to answer them. Thank you, Frederick. That was good. That was a good overview of uh, open source, and I think it's uh, it is actually excellent because we plan on having more open source. Uh, part of it. I know not everyone has uh, um, an open source background, so that was a good overview. Um, the first question we have. Oh, okay, Lauren, <laughs> your question was answered. <laughs> Uh, so I, I had a question around the licenses um, in terms of openness. Uh, Eclipse Foundation has its own, right? There's GPL. Uh, you know, everyone has their own the licenses that are out there. Which one would you consider to be the most open? Are those the most? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but the thing is, we, we have our own, which is called the Eclipse Public License, now yeah. in its uh, version 2.0. Uh, but, yeah. <clears throat> you know, when you start a project at Eclipse, you have a choice of licenses. Out of the box, if you use the EPL, the BSD3 clause or two clause license, the Apache 2 license, the MIT license, all of that, uh, you know, the, you, you don't need a, a big approval or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. non-controversial. You get whatever fits your, your use case. The main difference between the Eclipse public license and let's say the Apache license is that the Eclipse public license is what we call a copyleft license. Mm -hmm. That And that means essentially if you modify a uh, software project that is offered under the public license, you have to make your own modifications available under the same license and open to all, okay, on request. So this doesn't mean that you have to, uh, to ship your code, let's say, uh, which is open source or modifications with your product, but at least there must be a download link, you know, to the code somewhere or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is the license for most of the Bosch projects, for example, because in mm -hmm. their case, what they do is they use those projects that we've got in order to uh, provide the basic components of their Bosch IoT suite in the cloud. 
Okay, so the open source versions are exactly the same. Uh, they have the same APIs, the same everything. What we don't have in open source is the shiny UI on the top. Yeah. So okay. essentially, you know, the value that they built is the ease of use on the top mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the massive scale of their cloud, obviously. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. We don't offer that. But yeah. all, of, all, all of the code is there. Uh, then, I mean, if for whatever reason okay. you are guarded about keeping your modifications, then the Apache 2 license is a very popular choice and also very commercial friendly. Uh, and typically, that's what I would recommend. If you don't know anything about, either pick you know, to new to Eclipse newcomers, the, the Eclipse license or the Apache license, and you'll be uh, pretty fine. Okay. So uh, another question, um, uh, just in terms of architecture and how you fit. So I've been looking at the, uh, all the different projects. Do you have like a slide that summarizes the yes. different projects and how they fit in? Absolutely. Uh, because it was it was quite a minefield looking through fifty projects. <laughs> it's a minefield even for me, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, that would be helpful for everyone as well. Um, absolutely, and this is uh, a different deck that I have. So let me share, let me share the direct link. So if anyone is so inclined, you can download the PDF or whatever. If I find the the window. Oops. It seems I am. Are you, are you still there? Oh, yeah, it's there. Here. I, okay. here. It was in a different tab. I was all mixed in my, my window. So let me share this here. So that's another presentation where I covered that. Uh, let me share my screen again. So very quickly, because I don't want to bore you to that. Uh, but essentially, um, the tech that we've got uh, yeah, yeah. So the tech that we've got is in um, many, many different uh, spaces, but one, one way to see it is like this. This is a kind of generic uh, IoT architecture, okay? Uh, you see uh, stuff for the constraint device, stuff for the gateway or edge node, stuff in the cloud. So uh, we placed on the next slide here, the 20 ish most popular projects that we've got. Okay, not all of them, because this will be a real mess. So, yeah. what you will see is, for example, for constraint devices, we have MRA and UPM from Intel that are abstraction layers that you put on the top of your RTOS to abstract the board and sensors and actuators that you've got. Okay, this means that whatever platform you have underneath, the software environment is the same, so it's easier to switch from one board to another, for example. Mm -hmm. Then we've got a bunch of uh, protocols uh, or support libraries for various protocols that we support. Uh, so for MQTT, we've got uh, Eclipse PAHO. For uh, OPC UA, we've got Eclipse Milo. For co-op, we've got Californium, and for DDS, we've got Cyclone DDS. And I have a whole other deck comparing those various protocols, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so I can share that uh, yeah. uh, eventually, or even do that presentation to your, to yeah. your meetup at some point. Yeah. And then on, on the cloud side, uh, we have the very popular Mosquito MQTT broker, which is shipping with uh, most of the most popular uh, uh, Linux distributions already. Uh, we've got Eclipse Hono, which is a message platform that speaks MQTT, co-op, and many other protocols and converts that uh, internally to AMQP. Uh, and AMQP is a much better protocol for the data center environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Ditto for digital twins, uh, Lechan for device management, Hug is a device registry. And we've got some of those uh, projects like Kura and Capua that play many of the roles. So that's why the icons are, uh, you know, outside the little boxes. So they offer a wide array of features uh, in a specific uh, functional domain. And Kura and Capua are, are built uh, together. And, and, and <laughs> they are so simple to use, in fact, that uh, I have an intern working for me right now. I use Kura and Capua to build a smart agriculture solution. So uh, essentially sensors that measure the size of a plant, temperature, humidity, the, the, the amount of light that it's receiving. Uh, 
And from that, you know, you monitor the plants in, in, in Kura and you expose the data in Capua, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't have to write any code except the code on his little board that's driving the sensors. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really a mature and well uh, understood solution. So that's just a taste of what we've got. And then if you care about industrial IoT, we've got uh, Eclipse 4 Diac, which is a design and a runtime environment for PLCs. So if you are dealing with PLCs, uh, well, some of them have uh, an open source environment based on 4 diac and uh, 4 diac comes with a tool in the Eclipse IDE where you can program by dragging and dropping stuff in the window, your PLCs and that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very powerful solution and, and well supported uh, among our members. So as you see, lots of mm -hmm. diversity in there and that's just the top 20. Uh, right. So. Uh, We've got a page dedicated to the projects that we've got on our website, so I can uh, I can put the URL uh, in the chat. Yeah, that that would be good. So, in, in terms of these projects, do they uh, oh, is there any overlap between projects, and how do you deal with that in terms of interoperability? Well, that's the beauty of the Eclipse Foundation. There are some overlaps, and we don't care because ultimately, what we care about is simply this. We need healthy projects that yeah. are self-governing. So yeah. they decide what to implement and I will never prevent a project from doing something, you know, mm -hmm. telling them, hey, project X is doing the same thing, you shouldn't. Okay. okay. However, what I will try to foster are conversations, maybe at some level that we can bring adoption from one mm -hmm. project to another. Mm -hmm. Okay, and mm -hmm. that's what we try to encourage, but we will never prevent them from competing because mm -hmm. ultimately, I don't own those projects. Right, right, they right. are owned by their community, yeah. and I'm just right. there to serve them. Right. So, uh, coming up to one o'clock here, oh, it is one. Um, so, the, uh, the other question was, um, so in, in terms of the, the projects that you have today, what are you seeing are the most popular? Uh, you know, out of those three areas on the constrained device, the edge, the cloud, what are what are some of the more popular projects that you're seeing across those and more mature as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So Kura and Kapua certainly are worth to look okay. uh, because they've been around for a long time. They have a very strong community and all of that. Then there are the Bosch projects, Hono, Dito, Vorto, Hotbit. They are used at scale uh, by Bosch. Okay. So you have an assurance that, in fact, they did a performance test on their production cloud and they were able to, to support 15 million devices at the same time. <laughs> Wow, that's a lot of yeah, devices. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> Open source I mean, too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, believe me, our code scales. When I say it's production yeah, yeah, ready, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have approved yeah. it. Uh, yeah, so yeah. that's another poll of interesting development that we've got. Okay. Uh, also, our edge computing, if you care about edge computing, mm -hmm. certainly Eclipse IO Fog and Eclipse Fog OS are strong mm -hmm. and mature solutions that have mm -hmm. real customers right now mm -hmm. uh, in production. And then uh, we have an emerging thing that really uh, uh, be of interest to the crowd here, mm -hmm. uh, since uh, you know you have manufacturing and mm -hmm. people, and that's Eclipse Spa Plug. Mm -hmm. Eclipse Spa Plug mm -hmm. is a protocol essentially that goes on the top of MQTT. Uh, MQTT is fantastic. It's very mature. It's widespread. You can find support everywhere. Mm -hmm. The great thing about it is that it doesn't say anything about the payloads. And the bad thing about it is that it doesn't say anything about the payloads. That flexibility has a cost. So <laughs> you get, you know, this new robot and this new software stack, and they speak MQTT, but they won't understand each other. You need to configure stuff to write glue code depending on how flexible their solutions is. And in, in due time, this becomes a whole mess that you have to manage and it's yeah. error prone, time consuming, whatever. Yeah. Um, so Spaplog tries to resolve that in an elegant way. So we are mm -hmm. still using MQTT as the transport protocol mm -hmm. and Spaplog comes on the top of that. What it does is standardizes the payloads, it standardizes uh, what they call the topic structure, because mm -hmm. MQTT is publish and subscribe. You publish to a topic and you subscribe to a topic and the topic can be anything. It can be robot telemetry or mm -hmm. love letters to my wife, whatever. Uh, I wouldn't yeah. recommend trying this with your wife. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, no compatibility that there's no compatibility out of the box. So Spark plug yeah. defines, you know, name spaces and rules and everything. So that mm -hmm. out of the box, a Spark plug compatible robot and a Spark plug compatible software to interoperate without having to lose time on integration. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we've got uh, we had a webinar about uh, Spark plug and data yeah. So this yeah. is something I could share uh, with the community here if you yeah. are curious about it. Yeah, and, and you know the spark plug. Uh, um, so I I spent uh, part of my career uh, selling into operators, um, essentially back office mediation systems, which was right. Those are the things when you when you make a call, it generates the call detail and pick up, and eventually that's what uh, they figure out. You know how to bill you and. Um, it's the same there, right? There was a standard for a call detail record, but every vendor came in, they wanted to differentiate their switch or whatever product they had, and they added extra uh, layers to it. So this standard thing turned into uh, uh, a Frankenstein, right? Just So it sounds like uh, MKTT has gone down the same path as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so true. And then, uh, now, uh, and then uh, the other one uh, I have is, uh, uh, so my favorite one is, uh, um, uh, stream sheets. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, this uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get the uh, um, uh, stream sheets guys on as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, stream sheets, the motivation behind that? Because uh, to me, that made it makes it super simple to to start a IoT project, right? For a, somebody who's not even, uh, at least on the front end, not even technical, but you're essentially working with a spreadsheet. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the whole idea, a no-code tool that anyone can use in order to visualize data in real time. So the way mm -hmm. this works, and I can, I can share my screen. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be awesome. <laughs> so this is from there, from, from, the, from the, the, the project's uh, website, but essentially, you know, that's that's the best part. So Stream Sheets is literally Google Sheets, okay? It's an interface that's really similar to it, although they, they rebuilt it from the ground up, so there's no Google code in there. And essentially, what you do is you have your list of IoT real-time data flows. And from that, you can drag and drop that on the spreadsheet and then write formulas like you would do in any spreadsheet, you know, with advanced features and that kind of stuff. Okay, so you see the data changing in real time according to your uh, to your sampling rate mm -hmm. on your sensors, essentially, and then you can uh, create graphs and uh, and and do other visualizations that enable you to see the data in real time as well. And those uh, those uh, those those spreadsheets, so to speak, can be packaged between one environment and recreated elsewhere on another server. So. Uh, this is really implemented in a clever way where you can create things in a specific environment and then deploy them in another very, very easily just by importing a file. And uh, um, this is really usable directly by a business user because it really reflects if you define obviously the, the data streams for them, maybe they won't uh, <laughs> they won't want to type the URL to the, the MQTT <laughs> broker themselves. Okay, yeah. but once this is done, uh, a business user can really have access to the real time data and work like they would do with any spreadsheet. And that's mm -hmm. the whole idea: the fact that it's easy to use and uh, you know it's <laughs> it's useful <laughs> in a way to many many constituencies. It's use useful mm -hmm. to uh, business users because it's so familiar. At the same time, incredibly useful to developers because if you need to just quickly troubleshoot your data stream, you can mm -hmm. uh, you can use that, and mm -hmm. you know it's it comes in a single container. You can mm -hmm. uh, deploy it very very efficiently, and it's mm -hmm. all open source, so you don't mm -hmm. need to pay a cent. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. incredibly powerful. Yeah, and, and then I mean the the thing that I discovered this week was that you can actually take that data and uh, push it out using the IOFog to other things as well, right? So very yeah, easy. Yeah, exactly. And and we have a little demo that one, uh, well, I have an intern working from me this fall and uh, we are, you know, in a few weeks probably we'll publish that, but essentially, you know, it, it's just a, not a random, 
because I recruited yeah. him. But you know, he's, he's a typical university student, you know, mm -hmm. with some IoT experience, but not of the specific tools we are using. And he came to this, and he picked up Eclipse IO Fog as the platform, and he picked up Mosquito as the MQTT mm -hmm. broker and Stream Sheet, and mm -hmm. built an IoT solution for warehouse management where mm -hmm. you have a you know a scale that measures how many items there are in a specific bin. Mm -hmm. And then he was simulating other bins because he didn't have multiple bins and multiple scales and that kind of stuff, but still. <laughs> and, and the demo is really interesting because he had stuff running at, you know, at his friend's home and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you see in the IO fog manager, you know, the physical locations for the nodes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, all of that was, uh, in the end, all of the data come in stream sheets and you could see the data change in real time mm -hmm. according to what he was yeah. doing with the rolls yeah. of the paper. I guess it was more data. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. As we all do now. <laughs> yeah, and probably will be soon again. Uh, yep. That was that was my questions. Anyone else have uh, questions for uh, Frederick? Um, that was a super high level overview of uh, open source with some of the projects. And like I said, uh, the next step, uh, at least with uh, Eclipse, would be for us to dig into some of these projects. And uh, I'm trying to line those up. If you have a preference for any one of those in particular, let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, if uh, nobody has any questions, I oh, Rob, do you have a question? I just want to say thanks. That was a great presentation. I kind of followed uh, this, you know, especially through the lens of Bosch. Actually, I know it seems like Bosch has been driving a lot mm -hmm. of the uh, Eclipse IoT stuff over the years. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's great stuff. It's, it's it's I think it's matured really well. Um, yeah. I've spent most of my time in more of the kind of commercial IoT world. And so uh, it's it's exciting to see all these different projects having success. Yeah. And I mean, in case uh, folks don't know Rob, Rob's a guy you should get to know. He's actually, uh, I think, many publications. Put him in the. the uh, and we have him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, cool. thank you so much for the feedback. Really appreciate it, and uh, thank you for uh, you know for for being here. Yeah, definitely have to kick the tires on some of this stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. let me know if you need uh, guidance about anything. I mean, that's my job. You know, mm -hmm. we know that our stuff is intimidating a bit from the outside, and we've done a bad job at explaining what it can do. We're trying to correct that, you know, over time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, for the time being, it can be a bit intimidating. So it's my uh, uh, with pleasure that I can help any of you uh, trying to navigate it for sure. Yeah. Do you have Even, like? Oh, go ahead, Rob. Oh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you do. Do you have like a lot of just you know documents? On just being started, like people are familiar with a lot of major IoT platforms and edge mm -hmm. computing technologies that are out there. If they wanted to do something equivalent, you have so many projects. I can imagine people mm -hmm. would be confused. But if they said, "Hey, how do I stand up a what normally you would consider an IoT platform kind of thing uh, with your technology?" Is there kind of how-to documents to do that? The, the, we don't have a document like that because there are so many ways. That's the problem. You no. could, for example, set up something very quickly with Kura and Kapua, for example, that are built together and integrate so well. But then you can do it the best way. And then you can do it the do-it-yourself way by picking pieces right and left and assembling your own. But uh, what we have been trying to do, and this is a fairly new project that we have, it's called the Eclipse IoT Packages project, where essentially, uh, if you are a bit familiar with Kubernetes, yeah. uh, Kubernetes is a virtualization environment and essentially it enables you to run containers. And there's a standard in the Kubernetes world that's called Elm. So Elm is a descriptor where you deploy a whole solution at once on Kubernetes if mm -hmm. I simplify a bit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we are in this Eclipse IoT Packages project, we are writing Elm charts that enable you to deploy very easily on Kubernetes, pre-configured environments that enable you to kick the tires more easily on some of their products. And so uh, we have our first package that has been published a while back, a few months ago, that's called Cloud to Edge, that brings together 
Eclipse or no, Eclipse Ditto in Eclipse, um, or no, Ditto and Hogbit, if I remember well. And that's pre-configured, ready to test and play with. Uh, we'll come up uh, over time with other packages like that, that will give you pre-configured environments and potential combinations that you can leverage. So instead of having it documented in, because we have so many things that, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense necessarily to try to document all of the potential topologies. Uh, we came up with that way so that people can at least try it out more easily. The use case based as opposed to uh, project based. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. that's the thing because uh, once again, we are uh, Eclipse IoT is a collection of projects, each with it, its own governance, mm -hmm. and there's no one at the top. Mm -hmm. absolutely imposing a, a all encompassing vision stating that all of this fits in a unified platform and yada yada. Mm -hmm. What our steering committee does is, okay, there are trends in the market, we should support this, we should support that, we should innovate in this and that direction and that kind of stuff. But ultimately it's up to the projects to decide what they do. And so uh, even the steering committee doesn't have the power to impose anything on any specific project. And okay. that's the beauty of it, right? That's a community mm -hmm. approach, a kind mm -hmm. of democratic approach mm -hmm. where we all come together and build something. And sometimes you know, the downside of this is, yes, you don't have a one Eclipse IoT platform that integrates everything in a streamlined installer that you will mm -hmm. get very easily. So that's mm -hmm. the downside. And Eclipse IoT packages is there to fulfill this need for, hey, I want to kick the tires on this and that. Mm. Cool. Um, Stephen, did you have a question? I guess you can tell. Yes. Uh, <laughs> You've been waiting patiently. I, first of all, I, apologize. I got on a little late, but this is uh, very, no very, very interesting. How do you address the different major cloud players like AWS and um, Azure and so on? Maybe you discussed that earlier, but um, how, how do we take the perspective between those two, two different yeah. technologies? I, I didn't discuss them, but our position there is quite simple. We we work with them, although, uh, well, Microsoft is a member of the foundation, but not of Eclipse IoT. Okay. Uh, so we are having discussions with them, but they are less involved. In the case of AWS, they are not a member, but I'm in touch with the FreeRTOS team and other people at Amazon and other, our other members speak with them. But the thing is, if you look at it, Everything that we have is a, you know, code that you can compile and run on your own environment. So mm -hmm. in that sense, we provide multi-cloud support in the sense that our approach is based on the fact that you run our software wherever it fits, you know, in your organization or even in the cloud. And so we are not tied to any specific player and we want to keep it like that. At the same time, Spotplug, for example, uh, there will be Spotplug support in, uh, I'm saying it, there will be, maybe it's already there, I'm not sure, I need to check, but AWS Sitewise is a very popular uh, IoT component on the AWS platform. And they have, uh, you know, implemented uh, support for Spotplug. And we are, working with Microsoft on making the same happen with Azure, at least the discussions are on the way. So we work with them, but our approach to cloud is simply this. We give you the freedom to do whatever makes sense for your organization. And I think that's really important because the, the trouble with, let's say, hey, I will use FreeRTOS tightly integrated to the AWS IoT cloud and this and that. The pricing is good right now. The availability is good right now. You're happy. The day you're not happy, what will you be doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <Thank> you. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have this open source mindset where we give you the freedom to tweak everything, to control everything, then the next step is to say that my runtime environment is my own choice and I can do whatever I want to. You won't get that choice with Amazon. You won't get that choice with Microsoft because they want you to consume their stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, very true. But Any we work with questions? them. We love them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we need someone to run all this stuff, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. It. I mean, the cloud, especially public cloud or, or hybrid or whatever, is a powerful mechanism, right? I'm not trying to discount uh, cloud apps yeah. or anything mm -hmm. like that, yeah. but uh, <laughs> you have yeah, to be careful and, uh, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, any, any other questions? No? 
Anybody have any card? All right. Is that? Laurie, I, you're just joining. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry, I'm uh, I'm rather late joining. I do apologize. <laughs> yeah, Good to meet you all. no worries. We're actually okay. just uh, finishing we, we up. We start from the beginning oh, yeah. just for you. So <laughs> well, hello, I, everyone. I, <laughs> it, yes. it is just 10 o'clock in, here in the UK, in London. So oh, I'm, okay. I'm afraid uh, I got the time. <laughs> The time's yeah. going wrong. So uh, good evening and goodbye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have we haven't changed that time yet. But I will I will have a recording of this up in the next week or so, and uh, I'll post Thank it you. in the meetup group. And uh, um, and obviously, if if you have any questions uh, for Frederick, uh, you can reach out to me, or uh, uh, he shared a number of decks there, and I think all of them have his contact information. But uh, Brilliant. Well, um, I'll, I'll take a look at the deck. Thank you, Frederick, uh, for yeah. uh, in anticipation. And, yeah. uh, then Thank I'll, you for I'll get coming. Back Appreciate you. it. <laughs> <laughs> and, all, the uh, from, all the way from London. Yeah, it was a yeah. really long trip. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, just a reminder again, if uh, you want to continue the discussion as well, uh, we can carry on on uh, the Discord server as well. Uh, it, meet, the link is on the Meetup page. And uh, again, if you have any specific projects that you think uh, um, uh, would be good as follow up, and actually, Frederick, even for you, I, you know, uh, maybe uh, um, I'm just thinking about Rob's question just around the packages. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I assume you know you're creating some of the packages. It, 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 are they? I guess what's the contribution model going to be like for the packages? Well, essentially, it's an open source project on GitHub, okay. so anyone so, can use thing. and okay. contribute. Okay. It's just that okay. if, if you're not already an Eclipse contributor, then mm -hmm. uh, we have a process for that and that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, okay. But, uh, anyone okay. can contribute, anyone can use. Perfect. All right. So uh, let me know if uh, there's any specific projects. And uh, otherwise, I'll hopefully see you guys on Discord. and. Uh, Reminder again, next week we have Zipline. That's going to be awesome uh, with the uh, delivery drones and the, uh, what they claim to be the world's first autonomous uh, logistics network. So, nice. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and started in Africa too. Um, but uh, so that, that'll be next week. I think it's at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific uh, on the 4th. So, we'll see you then. Thank you, Frederick, and uh, you're welcome anytime. Thank you. And uh, uh, I'll be in touch with you if there's any Absolutely. questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay, stay in touch. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, nice end of the day. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>